have Brandon Amos from uh, Facebook AI Research in New York City, where he's a research scientist uh, working in machine learning optimization uh, with a recent focus on reinforcement learning, control, optimal transport, um, and geometry. So, Brandon, please take Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody had a chance to get some coffee and uh, uh, cake. Uh, so for this talk, we'll be uh, focusing a bit more on uh, machine learning aspects of optimization and also focusing a bit more on uh, continuous optimization rather than uh, discrete and combinatorial optimization. And uh, it will be a bit of a level talk and it's also I'm also very open to uh, going into any more of the details that um, if, if, if you're curious to uh, hear, hear some more. So one big question that I want to start with in the machine learning community is what should machine learning models look like? And should they look like a pile of linear algebra that people are just throwing out a lot of data like, like I'm showing in this slide, where we uh, take a lot of data, we throw it into the model, which is a pile of linear algebra, we get some predictions and feed that into some models. And Maybe if we train the machine learning models on the entire data set of the internet, then maybe we can get some reasonable predictions. And to be honest, I, I really like a lot of the work, recent work that's uh, been continuing to do this and like scale and like show the real limits of, of what we can uh, learn with, with big machine learning models. I think it's, it's very impressive work. And maybe, maybe it is true that we, we can throw big neural networks at every problem if we have enough data from, from them. Um, and if this is true, then maybe maybe it's time to uh, uh, maybe it's time for me to go home and, and have some tea or, or something. Uh, uh, however, I think that a lot of the uh, problems that people are using machine learning to, to model, they have an inherent uh, optimization based structure that happens uh, in the modeling part of it rather than uh, something that happens just over the parameter space. So, so in this talk, I'm not going to be talking about parameter optimization. I think that's, there's some very interesting not continuous non-convex problems that are, that are happening in parameter optimization. We're not going to talk about that here. We're going to focus on mostly continuous optimization problems that come up when you want to truly model uh, continuous optimization problems. And uh, what that roughly looks like is we have the same pipeline as before. We have data that we're putting into the model. And now inside, I'm, I'm proposing that the model should internally solve optimization problems when it makes sense to do so. And I usually write it like, like this, where the optimization problem takes as input maybe some outputs from some previous layers or some previous models, which I'm representing as CI. Uh, and this can influence both the objective and the constraints of this uh, of this optimization layer that I'm calling it. And the uh, objective and the constraints can also be parameterized, uh, with, which I'm representing with, with theta. And for any for every input, so, so for an individual like, uh, yeah, input, we want to solve this optimization problem, obtain the output, which I, I denote as the, uh, I'm saying it's the argument, usually we assume it's unique. Uh, and we return that and we continue passing that down the machine learning pipeline to uh, kind of, uh, again, get predictions for the task that we want to model and that we can define some loss on top of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, this adds kind of domain knowledge about the, the, the problem that you're modeling and has applications anywhere optimization is, is used to, uh, to, to model. And I claim that these kind of optimization layers can also be uh, trained and integrated nicely with all of the other differential optimization uh, or all of the other end-to-end -end modeling components that we have because we can differentiate the result of this optimization procedure with respect to the, uh, the parameters and the, and the inputs. Um, maybe for this community, I don't need to motivate this so strongly, but why should, why should we care about optimization-based modeling? And I think it's because optimization expresses non-trivial reasoning operations that naturally come up in many settings, such as control vehicle, like kind of, I guess control again in the vehicle setting. So control of, of continuous robotic systems, kind of control and motion planning for vehicular control or other, other settings. And then uh, on the on the right hand side, I'm showing some optimal transport uh, kind of kind of problems, also the supply demand transport. Uh, but the, the key takeaway is that uh, we can express operations themselves as being optimization problems if we symbolically know understand the parts of the world that we want to model as an optimization uh, problem. And in fact, I, 
I think at, at this conference, it's a, maybe a testament to how far we can go with, with just pure optimization modeling without using learning. Um, although I think the learning part is, is very interesting in settings where we can symbolically model most of the, uh, the problem. And uh, maybe, maybe we're in high dimensional settings where we want to learn other, like other latent parts that we're not able to uh, have enough domain knowledge for. Keep the mic, sorry, uh, on the shirt. Uh, uh, just the mic. Uh, is, is this is this better? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> So one last thing we can do with the optimization-based models is uh, we can model hard constraints either uh, internally to the model or as, as the output, which is otherwise a uh, dif difficult difficult to integrate with classical machine learning kind of classical neural networks. They don't have a good sense of constraints. But if we're able to uh, have a latent optimization layer, we can if, parameterize hard constraints that can be learned and that's what this example is showing where maybe we have some true constraints that are shown as these the blue polytopes or ellipsoids we can parameterize approximate constraints and learn to uh hopefully recover recover the original constraints and these can be latent in the uh the system as well uh so for this talk i am going to tour through uh the three three broad areas. Uh, firstly, we'll start simple and uh, as, as a warm up, and we will uh, kind of show how existing operations in machine learning can kind of be seen as uh, solving convex optimization problems. Uh, this is just to get a sense of the expressivity of optimization. More for uh, this is more targeted for the machine learning community. So just for, for intuition. Uh, Second, we'll cover some of the core kind of modeling foundations for differentiating to more general optimization layers. And third, we'll focus on control and uh, reinforcement learning problems of, of, of where we can use this. So the first point is that maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an obvious point for this, this audience. Uh, but I wanted to say that convex, even the convex optimization case, it's it's an, a convex optimization can be an expressive. Uh, it can be an expressive operation, and in, as I'm showing in this slide, we can express the ReLU and sigmoid as solutions to convex optimization problems. And the point I want to make is, even if we have a convex objective, like I've I've written in this slide. It doesn't mean that the output of this argument operation is going to be convex with respect to the parameterizations or the uh, the inputs or the conditioning to this this optimization problem. And this is uh, what lets us get nonlinear and non convex out non convex outputs, uh, even though we're solving a convex optimization problem. Um, and the next few slides I have will go uh, into slightly more detail into into how we can we can do this. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind is that I, I guess I'm not I'm not proposing that we we would we actually would want to uh, empirically replace the ReLU or sigmoid with optimization problems, but I think this is just a good starting point just to show that we can capture the ReLU and sigmoid as optimization problems. Uh, so the the first one, as I said, the, the ReLU, we can write it as the, the map, like the this rectification of this linear function with, with zero. So it's shown in this uh, as, a, as a black line in this plot. And we can see this as being a Euclidean projection onto the non-negative non orthans, like what I've, I've written at the bottom here. And uh, this is a convex optimization problem because it's just taking a point x and projecting it onto the non-negative non orthans. Um, and uh, it can be proven from first order optimality. You can see my, my thesis for the details on, on that. Um, and again, the main point is that this is kind of conditional on, on the parameterization or the input X. We can uh, compute this nonlinear function using convex optimization as part of the, uh, the model. So in theory, we could replace the standard value layer with this perspective that it's solving this optimization problem that's projecting. 
Uh, secondly, we can do the same thing for the, uh, the sigmoid. So the, the sigmoid is doing a projection onto the, uh, the, the zero one hypercube. Um, and the, uh, the interpretation is the same. So at the top, this is the, the closed form solution, but at the bottom is the uh, explicit optimization problem that the, uh, the sigmoid is, is solving. And of course, for, for all of these examples, we don't need to numerically solve this optimization problem because we have an explicit closed form solution. Um, and again, on the right hand side, I'm showing again the, the contours of the objective uh, and the, uh, the solution that, that comes up from optimizing that for every, for every x. And the, uh, the last example, this uh, soft max or soft arg max uh, for a slightly more correct name. Uh, it's also a convex optimization layer. It's a little bit more difficult to visualize because it's usually in higher dimensions, but it's again just doing a projection onto the, uh, the simplex. Um, and the uh, interpretation is the same. It's again solving a convex optimization problem. Uh, this plot is just showing, there's also a, a, an entropy term in the objective that this plot is showing the, the contours of. <coughs> and the, uh, the focus of a lot of my work has been on how do we generalize beyond these simple examples where we just have explicit closed form solutions to more general convex and non convex uh, settings? Where we generally want to uh, we parameterize a layer like like I have written here that's solving kind of arbitrarily parameterized uh, objectives and over arbitrarily parameterized objectives and, and constraints, and the uh, the challenge and the, uh, the interesting kind of work in this space is how do you uh, how do you use these in learning systems that that wants to learn the parameters, and because the rest of machine learning systems are like kind of use the derivatives and backpropagation, it would be nice to uh, be able to differentiate the output of these layers with respect to the, uh, the parameters. And it's easy when we have the closed form solutions to these optimization problems, but uh, when we don't, I think it's uh, there are quite a few computational and technical difficulties that come up that make us need to implicitly differentiate the output of, 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 of these layers. So uh, next we'll focus on if that that part on, on what the more general case of, of integrating these or differentiating through these layers looks like. Um, before I move on, are there uh, any any other questions or uh, comments? Yes. I was wondering about the differential. So the value is not differential. Right, right. That's right. It's not differential. Uh, yeah, I want it to be sub differential. Anything else? Any other questions? So, like casting the ReLU as an optimization problem, um, does that in itself have any value, or is more just an example that, um, that maybe we can extract other things? It's, it's mostly an example that we can extract in a generalized beyond. We'll see later that I think the uh, kind of soft argument has uh, taking this perspective leads to some natural extensions. For example, you can kind of see the soft argument as a, as a differential top one operation where we can then take the perspective for top K computations that they, we also want to project onto this kind of capped kind of simplex or knapsack polytope where there doesn't exist a closed form solution to these kinds of optimization problems. Uh, so that's maybe the one direct extension from, from this. But otherwise, these examples were just kind of to set the stage to show that we can represent interesting non-convex functions with convex optimization. Uh, uh, it's the, the entropy uh, function, uh, the discrete entropy function. <laughs> What is the form? The form of H. Yeah. Uh, what was that? The, the syntactic form. Uh, so it's the discrete entropy function. So the expected log probability or negative expected log probability of, of Y, which is which lies in the simplex. Uh, 
Okay, we'll move on to some uh, foundations, uh, kind of talk about how we can generalize some of, some of these concepts. So uh, maybe again to this audience, the implicit function theorem is, is uh, well known, but we'll uh, quickly review it uh, just in case. So we can think about implicit functions f as being defined by the uh, zero points of this kind of this other function g. And the question is, if we if we know we have a, an implicit function such as the sigmoid function, how do you compute the derivatives with respect to the uh, inputs or parameters uh, x in, in this notation? Uh, and the implicit function theorem essentially says uh, we can easily compute this by looking at the derivatives of of g in both directions and combining them by solving solving the system and this gives us the uh, derivative of the implicit function with respect to the, the parameterization x or the inputs x. And I'll next show how we can kind of use this well-known differentiation method to, to, have, like, to, to differentiate through the solutions to optimization problems so that we can use them in machine learning pipelines. Uh, so first we'll start with the general convex quadratic program. This is the original formulation that, that I considered in the OpsNet paper a few years ago. And this says uh, uh, we parameterize a convex quadratic optimization problem of, of this form with, uh, with linear equality uh, and inequality constraints. And the, uh, the idea is that we want a, a layer that's internally solving this uh, quadratic optimization uh, this quadratic optimization problem. And the way to uh, compute the derivatives is to, or the way to see this as an implicit function, of course, is to take the KKT optimality conditions of the optimization problem and to say, here is the, uh, the, the zero finding problem that's defining this implicit function of how the output of X star is changing or it changes with respect to the uh, parameterizations of this layer. And uh, we can then uh, take this next step of we apply the implicit function theorem to the uh, KKT optimality conditions, and this gives us uh, the this, this system that I, I wrote here of how you can compute the derivatives of the output of the uh, quadratic program with respect to the uh, parameterization of it. And a lot of my work has focused on I guess, computational issues that, that come up when you uh, want to do this and integrate it. So for example, this, uh, this derivative, it's uh, the Jacobian here, it's very uh, high dimensional. So, so we can't, we usually don't compute it uh, if, like, explicitly. We usually integrate it into uh, systems that, that optimize some downstream loss. Uh, uh, more details on this are available in my papers. Um, in the in the next slide, I'll generalize this slightly more before talking about a few other ex uh, examples and applications. Uh, so we can generalize uh, beyond the convex quadratic setting to more general conic programs, which I, I assume this audience also knows a bit, a bit more about than the usual machine learning audiences I, I talk with. But it generally says uh, optimize over this linear objective subject to uh, conic uh, constraints. Uh, where the, the cone can be uh, any combination of the convex cones that I've listed on this uh, the, this slide, and we can also we can capture a lot of uh, up the convex optimization problems as special instances of, of this. So uh, CVX pi, I think it's a does a great example or is a great a toolkit that shows that almost every convex optimization problem can be converted into a conic optimization problem of this form with a linear objective. Um, it might be a bit inefficient because it's uh, restricted to the linear objective, but I, I think natural generalizations beyond this exist as well. Um, and so the question is, uh, if we also have this more general uh, conic optimization problem, how can we uh, how can we also integrate this as a layer in, into, into for machine learning? And the, uh, the intuition is the same as, as in the quadratic programming case, where we again take the uh, some conic optimality conditions, which are a slight slight generalization of the KPT conditions for this, uh, we find the zero points of that and interpret that as the implicit function or the implicit system that characterizes the optimal solution to this conic optimization problem. And then we implicitly differentiate that and that gives us the 
I have the same derivatives of the uh, of the output of this optimization problem with respect to the parameterization. Uh, question? Yeah. yeah so z, it, like it's including x and like what else? Like dual variables. The dual variables and or uh, or slaps. Um, depending on the formulation. Uh, right. So all of this can also be used to compute the. Uh, <laughs> The derivatives of the optimal slacks or dual variables with respect to the parameterizations as well. I'm just showing it here for the primals. Uh, another question? So I'm, I'm curious as someone who's worked a lot with this. Um, so there's, I mentioned some trade off between formulating things as kind of problems, you know, which is kind of like, right, heavy duty machine array versus developing like more specialized solvers, right? Where you, have kind of, you do more work per problem, right? But it's maybe more efficient. Um, so I'm wondering if you just like, if you have sort of a general sense of like, you know, like how many problems is it worth it to go to like do like more special needs things basically or versus it's the more general machine, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a good question of, of um, I'll quickly repeat it. It's a, should, should methods use the general formulation of conic optimization to differentiate through or should a more specialized method be, or should more specialized considerations be, be kind of taken into account? And I think computationally, it almost always makes sense to specialize into the, to the problem that the specific class of problems that, that, you, that you're considering it. I've seen the orders of magnitude level of improvement of, of specializing. And I think this argument or this kind of reasoning is also the same as uh, the difference between implementing something in CDX pi that will automatically train, like, you know, transform and solve your. Uh, as as the microphone right there yeah, again. So the uh is this better? So the uh the intuition is the same, I guess, of, of using CVX Pi directly to solve an optimization problem versus implementing the specialized solver for, for that, where I think the specialized solver will give probably orders of magnitude level of, of improvement. But CVX pi and its general conic formulation are, in my opinion, really great for preliminary prototyping and, and debugging. So that's that's kind of how I, how I see it now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the time complexity. Yeah. The, the, uh, different. I mean, uh, to expand on this question, so you can use a the Right. Yeah, I haven't considered there, I haven't considered the uh, time complexity of any specialized algorithms. Also, yeah, not yeah, I haven't considered there too much. I could see that specialized algorithms have better time complexities as, as well, also for computing the derivatives, but I'm not I'm not too sure on, on that. The question was more that you mean the solver is more efficient in practice. are you sure that there are time complexity? Like sometimes you know you could have the that they all the same. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. It, it depends, I think it depends on the on the problem. Oh, one, one, one uh, question, yeah. yeah, I guess I have a question like, let's say comparing the different programs with the The question yeah, is if the gradients are similar. Yeah, or like let's is... say you, you have your um, program and you convert it to the or vice versa. Will you get kind of similar gradients out of both? In theory, they should be the same. Uh, in practice, they might not be. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, especially for the Hanuk one, we usually solve it with, uh, we usually solve this with LSQR or something, whereas uh, in an indirect solver, just for the uh, quadratic one, we were using the existing prefactorized KKT matrix that we used for the forward pass. So we were doing, we were using a direct solver for this one. I think this also touches on the sub-differentiability issues as well, where 
uh, the, especially conic programs, because they have a linear objective, are only subdifferentiable in a lot of cases. And so, an LS, something using like an indirect solver like LSQR could solve the derivative, could result in something very drastically different than what the direct solver would, would look like. Uh, Um, okay, anything else before we move on to a few applications? Um, so, so this is just a list of applications that I've, I've kind of thought about and others have, have looked at. It's, it's a non-exhaustive list, and I, I think there's, there's a lot that uh, I'm, I'm leaving out. Um, I, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll quick, just quickly go over this for the, uh, for the sake of time, but I, I just want to reiterate that I, I think a lot of domains, again, naturally model problems as solutions to convex or convex or continuous optimization problems. And I think in those settings, it makes sense to uh, learn some parts that you, you don't know, but still use the optimization parts to, to model in others. Um, I have a few focus. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll focus next on a, a few specific ones of, of these. I can. Uh, yeah, I'm also happy to talk about anything else specific that, that I don't cover here as, as well. So this is the one I mentioned uh, earlier in kind of response to Adam's question on well, why why is the perspective or is the perspective of, of kind of existing operations as being convex optimization layers? Why why is that kind of, is that useful beyond just kind of getting intuition? And I, I think one interesting thing is that it makes it natural to capture this kind of differentiable cup K operator, where we, we start with the uh, like we start with the softmax and we say, okay, this the softmax is just projecting onto this top, uh, like in a top one operation onto the simplex. And that looks kind of like that polytope looks kind of, kind of like this. So we have three three instances and we want to uh, if, we want to predict the argmax of those, which lies onto the one of the vertexes of these, and the soft argmax and it softens this, softens this and predicts onto the interior of this of this polytope. And the uh, generalization that doesn't have a closed form solution is if we want to generalize this to a top k operation, is we can formulate a very similar, almost identical optimization problem where where now H B is just kind of a, a binary entropy. Uh, function where the only difference between these two uh, these two versions now is that instead of just having the uh, the, the sum of the logits sum to uh, sum to one we can let them sum to uh, k so that we can then have the interpretation that we have kind of k k elements active in these in these settings and so now this gives us a polytope that looks like like this for example so if we have three total elements and we want to take the top two of them then. Uh, we can kind of enumerate as vertices every every possible the top two uh, uh, elements, and we can similarly project onto this to have a differentiable top k operation that also doesn't have a closed form explicit solution. And the uh, kind of machinery of, of implicit differentiation and everything I was just talking about uh, can be easily used to uh, integrate this in as a differentiable optimization or as a differentiable layer. Um, again, back to the point of having a general versus specific implementation for, for this, we also found that uh, the uh, specialized solver for this is multiple orders of magnitude faster than uh, solving it with a more general kind of cone, as a more general cone problem, um, especially because it's uh, the dual is only a univariate. There's only a single constraint. So we, we typically solve it by just kind of doing some kind of bisection or kind of multi-section uh, algorithm to solve the dual. And then the implicit derivatives also we specialize in our orders of magnitude faster than the generalized solver, which makes the computational time of this almost the same as just solving the pretty softmax operation uh, because we specialize the solving. The other interesting, I guess this is a, uh, these are again, uh, or this, yeah, the, the Birkhoff polytope or the set of doubly stochastic matrices. Um, it also has this kind of projection flavor where the Birkhoff polytope is an interesting you know, polytope that captures uh, the permutations or is used also for you know, optimally coupling uh, discrete measures. And, uh, and this other paper, the Gumbel-Sinkhorn paper, 
I've looked at this question of can we project onto the Birkhoff polytope and then use that for the same reasons that we use this differentiable top K operations, or we, the same reasons we use all of the other differentiable projections. <coughs> um, and they showed that they are able to uh, do that to differentiate through this optimization problem and uh, have this idea of, of, kind of latent learning latent permutations that, that exist on the, the Birkhoff polytope. Uh, the other interesting uh, application is. Uh, you can, if you think of the uh, the train of an SVM or some linear classifier, then you can also think of the optimal hyperplane uh, of that as being a function of the data. And so, then uh, in the SVM setting, this this function or this uh, like learning in SVM is a convex optimization problem. And this paper Meta Opnet also uh, use this idea to use a differentiable classifier for, for meta learning where they, they have very small training data sets. So it makes kind of makes sense to uh, uh, incorporate this kind of differentiable classifier into the met like this meta learning uh, pi pipeline where, where it's able to uh, better understand how the uh, how the embeddings of the data influence the decision boundary induced by the classifier. Um, here's a slide with a lot of math. <laughs> it's it's a, I left a lot of this off of off of this talk, and I, I think that there are a lot of computational numerical considerations that needs to be uh, taken into account when implementing these these layers. Uh, I um, a lot of these are showing efficient uh, solutions to. Uh, like these KKT systems or the conic residual systems and showing how to implicitly differentiate it. I think this is my code from uh, four, four years ago. Uh, I almost forget what it's doing. I think it's, it's implementing a specialized primal boolean carrier point method for solving batches of optimization problems and differentiating through it. Uh, it's very difficult to read and for, for me to read, even though I, I wrote it. Uh, so. My point is, uh, I guess practitioners shouldn't care about this, especially if they want to prototype a method. And uh, it's important to consider, especially if you're implementing the foundations or kind of developing specialized algorithms. But I think for for prototyping or for kind of going out into new domains, I think it's uh, very difficult to uh, have all of these in, in your head at, 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 and develop like the proper you know, implicit derivatives necessary. Um, and for, for this reason, we, we have this NERVS paper that's showing that we can uh, just take CVX pi and essentially output differentiable convex optimization layers in PyTorch, JAX, and TensorFlow using essentially one line of code on top of existing CVX pi uh, settings. And I think this is a, a great prototyping tool because it, it, it takes any, anywhere where CVX pi can be used for prototyping and it adds this kind of derivative part on, on top of. So, my focus is mostly on using this for uh, in the machine learning settings, but I think in the OR and other other optimization settings, it also just gives the uh, the adjoint derivatives necessary for sensitivity or perturbation analysis of how the output of your optimization problem and it changes as you change the uh, parameters. Um, here's another diagram with some more more details, essentially uh, showing again that we can have layers that are defined by CVX pi. Um, I'll skip over some of the code examples, the quick kind of takeaway. You can also see all of these in our blog post on, on CVX pi layers. Uh, essentially, I, uh, it, it made it so I can re-implement this. Uh, this is the OpsNet QP. It makes it possible to re-implement in, in 10 lines of code what I had, with, what I had previously implemented in, in 1K lines of, of code. And uh, computationally, it's it's uh, similar or maybe even slightly better because of some of the special like sparse operations that CVX pi can can handle. Uh, yeah, these are smaller examples uh, which you can find in our blog post. Uh, this is showing a sensitivity analysis example. So it's saying. Um, it, Here's the uh, the optimal decision boundary that we can find with the linear classifier, and it's asking. Uh, so we, we represent the optimal hyperplane with, with theta here, and the derivatives are 
that's saying uh, how does the hyper or shows how does the optimal hyperparameter change with respect to the uh, individual data points. And here we're plotting out what those derivatives look like so we can kind of see which ones impact the decision boundary the most. And uh, yeah, like which one, yeah, which ones are the most important. Um, so that, that's it for a lot of the uh, applications of the convex setting. I think it's an interesting question of, of to also ask how, how do we handle non-convex and other generalizations of this? And there are a few things we can do in the non-convex setting. Uh, one is that we can also we can continue applying implicit differentiation uh, now on the fixed point of an non-convex solver. Um, I think this is a uh, it can work sometimes. I think if your non-convex solver hits fixed points, for example, but I, I think it can also be tricky because uh, maybe fixed points aren't always guaranteed. And I think, in my opinion, there's not in the non-convex setting there's there's not something as consistent or reliable as the uh, KKT system. Uh, another one that Mammal does. I also claim that Mammal is some, doing some kind of differentiable optimization in, in an unconstrained setting by uh, kind of unrolling gradient steps. Um, or you can also unroll the steps of, of another optimizer uh, in the, in the non-convex setting. Um, so uh, that was it for the core part of part of the talk. Um, how how am I doing on, on time? So yeah, we have less than ten minutes total with questions. So up to you. Okay. Okay. Less than a little more, Brandon. I can cut my. I'll uh, maybe quickly present the uh, motivation for this next section, skip through a lot of the details, and uh, I'll be around later for uh, anybody who would be curious and hearing some more details. It's also all, all online, um, and I posted my slide deck on my website if anybody's curious and seeing the details. So the, the motivation for something I also have been I've thought about after after the convex setting is uh, the reinforcement learning and, and control setting of uh, how should we optimally control dynamical systems that we also don't know. Uh, and again, I think the community is like, uh, I guess the, the model free reinforcement learning community is essentially saying, well, if we have enough data, we can just throw big neural networks at the, uh, the problem to estimate uh, the, the value estimate or the policy. And um, I think there's or there, there has been some work on the you know, model-based settings that also say, oh, we can try to estimate the system dynamics from data. And then there's also uh, multiple ways you can combine you know, the, the future plans that the, of the system dynamics with, with all of this. So generally, for, I guess, if you want a reinforcement learning policy or a policy for optimally solving an MVP, it takes some state as the input. It uses some combination of uh, a neural network, system dynamics, and the future plan, and it outputs the uh, next action to take. If you try to take the model free approach, it's uh, maybe very general and doesn't make many assumptions about the world, but I think it's uh, very susceptible to. Uh, data efficiency and stability issues and even generalization issues because it's it's not truly aware of the MVP that it's, it's solving. Um, whereas I think the model-based setting, it's uh, appealing because we can explicitly say, here's the MVP that we want to control. Here's here's a control optimization problem. Um, and we can try to learn components for that, but it's uh, not ideal because uh, it's, of, it's often re restraining on the uh, capacities of of, 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 the, of the policy. So model predictive control is uh, it is broad class of control methods and it's it can be used to control very non-trivial systems such as robotic systems uh, and the vehicular systems, many, many other industrial control systems as well use this. And I'll uh, maybe skip ahead quite a bit. And I'll, I'll essentially just say, I'll say the key takeaway for this entire part of my talk is that we can also differentiate through the solutions to control optimization problems, even when they're non-convex. And it, it uh, helps us, it, it helps us in quite a few settings uh, for the same reasons that the, the smart predict and optimize is also useful. 
I would say this is a specialization to the uh, control setting. Um, this is showing for LQR control. Uh, if you have a linear problem, then uh, interestingly, the backwards pass is also another control problem to compute the derivatives or to compute the sensitivity analysis. Um, I'll skip through through most of this. Uh, this is showing you can you can also differentiate through uh, the like, <coughs> sampling based optimizers and other other very non convex optimizers. So so this is showing we can differentiate through the the cross entropy method. Um, and yeah, that was that was a quick tour through the differentiable control parts. Um, I think this one pops back up to a much more kind of general slide just on differentiable optimization, just kind of reiterating the three kind of main main points of this talk of, of saying that we can use differential optimization as this kind of this, this something that we can put in, in modeling pipelines for machine learning. It could be used just as any other layer that we have in machine learning. I think there are applications at anywhere optimization expresses non trivial modeling operations. And while we have focused on mostly convex continuous Euclidean settings here, I think that they are conceptually, these ideas can be extended far beyond these, even into, uh, I guess that's what we have in, in most continuous seeing in, in a, a discrete combinatorial and non Euclidean settings as well. I'm very excited about, about these directions. Um, so you can, uh, again, you can find the, my slides on my on my website and this talk covered a lot of loose ideas from this chain of papers that I've, I've had since 2017. Um, with, with that, uh, that's it. That's all I have for the talk. Uh, thanks for coming and I guess I'm happy to take a question or, or two now. So we have time for about two or three questions. So if you have one, please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, so when the optimization is the last layer, you can sort of say that the optimization allows you to incorporate structure or knowledge or those kinds of things. But I guess in your sort of like first half of your talk, you were talking about optimization as an intermediate layer, and then there's like some sort of like prediction after that. In that case, how do you know what the right optimization formulation is? And like, do you just throw the biggest conic problem at it, or do you have specialized problems? Or even once it's learned, yeah. how do you interpret it? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question on yeah, what is it, what would it mean to have truly a latent optimization layer where you have a lot of things happening on both ends? I, I think to be honest, I haven't thought about it that much. And I I I, I don't know how optimistic I would be of arbitrarily parameterizing intermediate cone cone programs without the right reason to do so. I think the biggest the, I guess the thing that I would be most optimistic about is the use of this in uh, in these predict and optimize settings where you, I guess the, the prediction wouldn't maybe in turn involves this like, optimization problem at the end, as, as you say, and then downstream, there's like another optimization process that, that happens after, after that. I think I would maybe be most optimistic about, about that setting, but, but you're right, it's, it is much harder to think about what, what it would mean for the outputs to be to be very latent. Okay, one last question, if any. So you mentioned something about history at the end that can you say something? Yeah, I think uh, maybe we'll be hearing much more today about the discrete setting as well, but I, I think the uh, the differentiability, I think, becomes a very serious issue there because if you have arbitrarily parameterized discrete optimization problem. Then, and you have a discrete output space, then very likely there's a much less, much less of a notion of derivatives of what it means for the parameterization to, to change as you, or for the output to change as you change the uh, parameterization. For example, slightly perturbing the parameterization of the discrete problem probably doesn't change the output of the, of the optimization problem at, at all because it's, it's discrete. And therefore, the, the derivative or subderivative is. Is zero. So I, I think a lot of the work in this space focuses on how do you overcome this issue of having zero derivatives every, everywhere. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.